All right. So I'm Greg. I'm CEO and co-founder of Buildly. Uh, before that, I was uh, CEO and co-founder of Humanitech. And before that, CEO and co-founder of Total Data. Total Data was an open source project built in Kenya, uh, Nairobi, uh, for uh, program management for NGOs. Uh, specifically at that point, it was for Mercy Corps, and we've split it out since then. And started my whole journey into transparency and, and how to deal with transparency, radical transparency especially. Um, software teams, product teams, all of that. So that's kind of a little bit about me. I'm also the author of a, a book that just was, uh, I guess was released last month called uh, Radical Transparency for Software Teams. Uh, it's, it borrows a lot from different radical t um, <laughs> techniques. Uh, specifically though, it's, it's around transparency and how you manage your project in GitHub, um, as well as it works for any Git, I guess, process. Um, and bringing a little bit about bringing the product team and the development team together to work better a little bit, as opposed to two separate teams, which is the way a lot of times it works. Um, but for open source projects especially, I think part of what it, what it does is provides a way for team members to feel like they're more included in the decision making process. Um, and for people that are contributors, especially if you have commit access, and for those who don't have commit access, that they can feel like they have an opportunity to communicate and get their ideas into the, you know, the backlog so that you can actually get things that you want in that process and make it a better project overall. Um, this is the book. Um, I think the QR code at the beginning had it also as well. Uh, if uh, you're interested also, we have uh, a, a couple copies in the back that we can, you can take a look at, but it's always better to <laughs> download the EPUB book and just use it that way. Um, so we'll start a little bit, but I think for me, what's going to be interesting is to find out what you guys are interested in learning about or talking about. So I'm, I'm curious, how many people here actually are software developers or have written software? Wow, like everybody. Um, okay, and how many of you have contributed to an open source project? Nice, yeah, sort of, okay. And, and how, many, how much of that contribution was actual code versus an issue? Uh, code, any people that's contributed code? A few, a few, how about issues? A lot more, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, and I think that's a good way to get started. Uh, I'm curious, for, especially for the issue folks, how many people felt intimidated to submit that first issue to an open project? Yeah, a couple. Did it feel like it was not, maybe not welcome in some cases? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Imposter syndrome, maybe, that's a term people have heard. You feel not quite like you're, you're good enough to commit to something to that? Yeah. I think that's a, a problem for a lot of people in open source software. Something that I've seen, not just in open source, obviously, but in, in organizations that I've worked in in the past. And one, uh, I'll go into a little bit here, um, is, is we're gonna go a little bit into what Radical is and how we've solved some of those problems. Um, radical, uh, fundamental nature of something, right? Far reaching or threats. This is not this kind of radical, <laughs> right? That's a very different kind of, although fun kind of radical. I don't know if that's even a politically correct movie anymore, uh, but I think it's a, it's a good representation of that sort of idea. And then therapy. So, and just to be clear, I am not a therapist, <coughs> never have been, but I do work uh, a lot with software developers who need therapy. Right. <laughs> so I think in that in that sense, I act as one a lot of times, especially if I'm uh, their manager. Uh, but I think for me, it's about trying to be like that in some cases. If you're managing a project, especially if you're dealing with a lot of software developers, that can be, as we all probably know, a little opinionated in some cases, a little difficult to work with in some cases. But getting things done, hopefully, and that's I think what we're going to hopefully bring out of this as well as a way to turn that energy into something positive. So uh, my first attempt at implementing radical transparency was while I was working for Mercy Corps. I was based in Portland, Oregon, and the team I was working with at the time, this was 2012, was in Kabul, Afghanistan, which you can imagine that's a rather long commute it's a long, even for remote work, that's a difficult time zone to manage, right? 
Uh, but at the same time, I think it taught me a lot in that process. And I think um, I learned a lot just about how to manage something from that distance, but also just how to manage your team and how to work with uh, people that really need something urgently, but aren't always communicating exactly what they need because they're afraid in some cases. You, you say open and transparent and open source to somebody that's on the ground in Kabul, Afghanistan in 2012, they're not going to be real happy about that. Right? They want everything to be secure. They want everything to be private. They don't want to talk to anybody else about what they're doing. So this was a, a difficult situation for us to implement an open source project. In. Uh, but we, we were able to do it. A lot of what happened, though, came out of uh, initial conversations with these folks. So these are the, the heads of the team that were there for Kabul, Afghanistan, for Mercy Corps. And a lot of them worked in the field, but most of them were managers. And what happens when you get a manager's opinion on how to implement something in the field? Yeah, you get, you get the wrong idea pretty quickly. Um, and what we learned when we went there after talking to them is like, one, we couldn't get out to the field to actually talk to those folks, so we had to bring them in. But once we did, we started to see just how much of it we had built for the managers and how much we hadn't built for the team in the field. And I think that was where we, we really started to figure out how do we provide this information to the team without them having to come back in? How do we work remotely in an area that's actually where they're pretty close together? Um, and kind of what the biggest thing we had to do was create a new culture of transparency within the organization, transparency with the team, and as well as sharing and understanding these things as, as they were going back and forth. It needed to go from top to bottom, but also bottom to top. Um, so a lot of what we did was build reports. Initially, what we did was just share the requirements and then share the, the things that we were building, and we weren't getting enough feedback at that point. Um, so we started building reports, built a, a global dashboard for the whole project, and started getting feedback from teams. I don't know if you can see it very well, but um, outside of that, there was a survey, and we essentially had teams from all over the, all over the world actually contributing back once we opened this up to what they needed for their program, right? So Kabul was the first place we went, but then we went from there, we went on to um, uh, most of West Africa and East Africa into Jordan around the refugee crisis that was happening in, um, in that area. And so we spent a lot of time getting feedback from everybody across the, across the globe uh, for this project. Um, and then, and this is kind of where we came back to the idea of how open can we be? How, how long can we keep it this way? And I think one of the things that was really interesting was um, we tried a couple times, once we got management involved, we tried to close things back off again, right? Because we wanted to focus on the very specific ideas that were happening from a particular part of the team, right? And they wanted a dashboard. They wanted this. They wanted red, green, yellow status, all of these sort of things. And we tried to put that in, and we blocked out the rest of the organization. And I think what we saw, and I think there's a story that probably many of you have heard from the past, <laughs> Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, right? Or I think it's Theranos or Theranos, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, but this is, I, no, I had nothing to do with this organization, just to be quick. Um, but uh, it's an interesting story, and if you haven't seen the, the movie or read any of the books around this, um, what I think what happened here more than anything else is fake it till you make it. Um, but I also think there were some communication problems between the, the engineering team that was working on the problem and the marketing and the sales and everybody else that was trying to manage that process. And there's some, there's some documentation for it. And I'm not saying, I'm not at all excusing what she did, right? But I do think there's some interesting problems in what happened there. She was working on a problem, closed the doors, the contractors weren't allowed. She was trying to really focus on getting something done, but she was not telling them how far behind she was. And the rest of the team didn't know either. It was all done in secrecy. And so the, the team didn't know how to manage it on the marketing side, right? Now, a lot of open source projects, we don't have marketing, right? We're lucky to have any you know, contributors, really, in some cases. Um, but I think you still need to have some sort of open backlog, open communication with your team, right? As well as the, the users that you want to use and do it from the start in, in a transparent mode. 
So how many of those software developers that were here, how many of you on the first day commit your code back up to GitHub? One, two, okay. And, and, and are you actually committing the code at when it's working or just committing when you're done at the end of the day? No? Done at the end of the day. End of the day, done? It's an interesting, I don't know if you've, if you've ever tried it, but if you have a team and you, you go from the start of a project or even a sprint and ask them to commit from day one to their local, not, not obviously their dev branch, obviously not something that's gonna go to a server, but their branch and have them work transparently from the very, very first commit, right? So you're not working, you're not working on a problem and committing that code to a server that's being deployed, but you are committing it so that other developers can review it, right? You want, you want your own personal branch. Some people use feature branches. There's a lot of different opinions around how to use GitHub and branch management. But I think if you find a way to be open and transparent from the very beginning, and I get a lot of the same looks that I'm getting right now in this room when I suggest that. It's like, I don't want people to see the code that I, you know, I haven't compared. You know, I want to see the I want to see the actual code that's finished and done and clean. I want to share that. I don't want to share the dirty stuff. But that's how you learn, right? Is is you have especially if you have leads involved with juniors, uh, you want the juniors committing ahead of time so the leads can come back and help out. I think it's a, it's an interesting exercise. And if you try it, what we've seen is paired programming. Has anybody done paired program XP? Yeah. When you're working with somebody right next to you, right, all of a sudden you're learning from them and the mistakes they're making and they're learning from you and the mistakes you're making, right? It's the same thing, right? Only you're doing it in a Git log with the backlog that you can actually then put comments in. It's not, it's not fun. I won't tell you, like to start off, it's a little nerve wracking, but eventually you start to get into a flow with it and you get really comfortable with that. And I think that's, that's, op that's radical transparency, right? That's at the very beginning you're doing something out in the open, sharing all the mistakes you're doing so that you're improving and the team's improving. I think the, uh, the team division sort of process, that's kind of what we're talking about a little bit too, is you have a product team and you have a development team. And that communication that you run into, those, those problems a lot of times in software happen because of communication problems, right? You're not understanding what the product manager was asking for, or they're not understanding your explanation of why it takes an extra two weeks to do this or that problem. So I think having that division, bringing those two teams together, working more closely, working more open and transparent, that's what's gonna help bring and speed up that process and help you with the communication. Um, and there's, there, are some, there are some costs um, when you do um, uh, secrecy in, in, a, in a project, but there's also some costs when, you, when you're too transparent, right? And we know some, uh, probably a lot of people work on open source project and proprietary during their day job, or um, they work on a proprietary system that has some open source components, but they're not allowed may maybe to contribute back to those projects. Um, I think a lot of what you're gonna wanna see when you're collaborating over all of these is working together on projects that do not have um, proprietary under underpinnings to it. Um, you can, you can still contribute and be radically transparent in that process, but when you open it even internally, an inner source, if you, is everybody familiar with inner source? Um, I think there's a, a small movement with inner source managers, it's basically running your internal project like an open source project. Even if it's proprietary, you're sharing it with the rest of the organization. So I think that's where collaboration, too many, sometimes you can get too many people commenting back and working through that process, but focusing on the open uh, initial commitments, right? The, the open process is what's gonna really help you to move that thing and, and learn a lot faster through that process. Um, we sort of talked a little bit about this, the product delay and demise. I think when collaboration fails, innovation does stall. I think what, what you need to be able to do is find a way within your project to push for openness, to push for collaboration on that, to push for being really transparent at the very beginning, but also understanding that innovation has to, has to go first, right? And you have to be able to make sure that 
anyone that's in a lead position or anyone that's in a junior position, they all have the opportunity to communicate through that process, right? So if you're in those meetings, those backlog grooming sessions, right? Um, and you have a team that's, you know, well balanced, let's hope, like maybe some seniors and some juniors and maybe a product manager in there, letting all of the voices be heard as opposed to just one dominant voice for each particular group. I think that's the, the main thing that helps push innovation. In the organizations that we've worked in, if you go to a, a, a group with a bunch of junior developers and put them together, they'll have a conversation and they'll figure out some innovative ways to come at it at a project, right? You put one senior developer in there, they all just look to the senior developer. Right? And they wait for them to say whatever it is that they're going to say, and then they comment on that maybe. More than likely, though, if you're a product manager or if you're a lead and you're asking for that feedback and you're asking, what do you think about this problem? What do you think about how should we address this? Then you're going to get something new. Right? That's when you're going to get innovation. It rarely happens from the, from the leads. Right? The leads are, are good at doing what they're doing and getting things done, pushing out code, reviewing code. They don't usually have a lot of time to think about a new way to approach a problem. Sometimes they're allowed to do that. Other times, most of the time, they're not. Okay, so striking a balance. Working under pressure. I think we've all had that scenario where you've got a deadline coming and you need to be able to push out some code really quickly. How do you handle that? I think one of the things that we um, do with the radical process is uh, helping your team build out faster while still getting feedback along the way, right? So if, if you've ever been stuck waiting for a code review to happen, right? Or if you've ever been stuck waiting for somebody to, to test the issue that you've pushed out to the server, I think this is where that communication involving the product team from the very beginning so they can see as it goes through, if you use Kanban, let's say, and it's going through that process, you're, you're allowing them to see where it is in that process, which swim lane it's in. Now they can follow along and they're waiting to see when that finally goes to test so that they can actually go through and test it on the server, right? So I think the important thing, no matter what type of project it is, is addressing everybody in the room and on the project, all of the stakeholders need to be more directly involved. It's a little different than a traditional, let's say, agile or scrum process where you've got the chickens, and I always hated that, chickens and the pigs and the breakfast and the commitment. It's, I don't know if <laughs> it's disgusting. But I think, I think if you bring everybody to the same table and you're all equal partners in building that out, you, then all of a sudden that communication problem goes away for a lot of the things that you're, ha you're dealing with, right? So it's m one of my many qualms with Agile and especially Scrum. Um, tools for transparency, obviously version control, we've talked about Git. Project management software, how many people use like GitHub for issue management? Or, oh, okay, how about Jira? All right, Jira, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm sorry for you folks. Um, <laughs> Of, the, of the, the GitHub folks, how many have a different tool to manage the, the backlog and the grooming with the product team? Yeah? Number, is it usually like an Excel file or something like that, or Microsoft Project? Yeah. One of the issues with project management software for a lot of folks, although I, I, one thing I think Jira and Atlassian does well is you can actually do both in one suite and see that. I don't like to give them props about much, but that, that, they did do well. Um, but if you, don't, if you don't have that tool, right, a lot of times you're going back and forth. You're looking at somebody's Excel spreadsheet to see where is it that this, this particular backlog epic is going to, when is it going to make it? Can I comment on it? Can I be part of that process? I think that's the other thing that is a problem right now for a lot of software developers and slows down innovation is you don't, you're not involved early on in that process. Business requirements being gathered, you don't want to be bothered most of the time, right? Or they don't want to bother you is more likely the problem. So getting, finding tools that can actually interact so you can see what's happening, and let's say it's Microsoft Project or let's uh, maybe Trello, right? For our Atlassian friends. Um, that I think you can actually, there's APIs already there for Trello 
you can build and you can bring that into GitHub so you can see those things as they come through as epics, right? And you can comment on them there and then they can see it back. Well, I don't know if there's a two-way sync on the Trello integration, but there should be. Um, so I think that's, that's the, the main thing. And then a communication platform like Slack. I think as long as everything's going through Slack, for example, if you push all of your Trello, um, whatever they call them, cards, I guess, <laughs> into, into Slack, and then you put your GitHub issues into there as well, now you have one place where you can communicate, right? One place where you can comment on those things. And it's, you know, I think there's other tools similar to that that can bring in that same sort of combination of the two. But looking way to bring that communication, ideally you want one platform, right? And I will say there is a platform that does that, and it's called Buildly. Um, but at the same time, I think there's a number of tools out there that also allow you different ways to do this and control it the way you want to do it. But that, this is, I can't emphasize this enough, how important it is to make sure that you as a developer are involved in the early requirements gathering and communicating early on in that process. And you, a lot of you have probably had a lot of struggle getting that done. But keep pushing for that. And I think if the other side of it is, if you're including them in your process, right? If they're seeing where GitHub tickets are being managed or Jira tickets are being managed, and they can see that process, it's clear to them as well, they're gonna want to see that benefit on the other side as well. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, so this, well, stakeholder inclusion, that's what we were just talking about. So um, the, other, the other part of transparency, I think, is embracing mistakes, right? A lot of junior developers, a lot of senior developers even, I think have a problem uh, letting people see their mistakes, right? They, they want to have this air of you know, perfection around them, I guess. Um, and you're not going to learn without sharing your mistakes, right? You, you might struggle through and find something on Stack Overflow, or you might find something, but I think getting it in person is certainly a lot better in terms of being able to ask questions back and forth and do it real time. Even if it's on Slack, if it's a remote team especially, obviously that's the best choice. But I think having the, the bravery, let's say, and the, the openness to be able to just commit right from the beginning out into the open and get feedback on the things that you're doing or ask for help God, for junior developers, please just ask for help. It's okay. That, that's what we want, right, is to get that kind of understanding of where you are in the process and what you need help on because nobody wants to be backed up because somebody was stuck banging their head on a problem and didn't have the, the capacity to ask for help. But part of that is as leads and as managers you also have to in, ask for that you have to make sure it's safe for them to do that they have to feel like they can be heard in that process and that they will be able to share that openly and not get ridiculed for it right so i think i think overall the the mistakes in, in open in the open so let's say making mistakes in the open i guess is the, the best way to learn Right? And everybody does it. And as long as you're actually part of that, that uh, embracing of that, then I think other people will feel comfortable doing that as well. And should you share your mistakes, other people will share them as well. So that, that's part of the, the role in implementing transparency. The, the other thing that is really important, I think, it, I, I'm just curious, how many people work for startups? or? work for a startup a couple hey okay nice and how many people work for i don't know big enterprise companies in seattle like microsoft right few okay okay a couple um i think that 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 the um the role in transparency it's obviously gonna be a little easier to get that done in a startup than it is in let's say microsoft or someplace like that but you have to keep advocating for it, right? You have to start with small things. You don't, you don't necessarily want to go big right from the beginning. But you, if you show that your project is benefiting from it or that you're benefiting from it or your team members are benefiting from that, then it's easier for other people to start to participate in it down the road. So you have to push your organization. And if that happens, think back to that Theranos problem, 
right, where they had all that privacy. They, there was no transparency in that organization whatsoever. And a lot of startups think that they have something so revolutionary that it should be protected in every way. That intellectual property, they need copyright, they need, I mean, the reality is most everything we're doing has been done before, right? And so why not ask, how can we do it better? Because that's really what's gonna get you there, right? Being first to market is good, but it rarely is what actually uh, is gonna make your company money, right? It's what it's gonna be is being best to market. And to be best to market, you have to be sharing, right? Maybe it's just in your organization, but ideally it's with the community and you're building a community around your product at the same time, right? So like I said, start small, scale up your transparency efforts. Um, and I think overall, and you'll see in an organization that eventually will be grateful for all of that process that they've sort of trimmed down by just being, you know, a little more open about what you're working on. And, and you'll reduce meetings. You will reduce the number of, of comments you have to take on your issues, things like that. So not just a buzzword, radical transparency. I think even just transparency is good enough in most cases, right? But if you can embrace the idea of being radically transparent in your organization, uh, or even on your team, or on your project, I think you'll see a lot of benefit from that initially, but you'll also see the long-term benefit of your organization shifting towards a more uh, community-driven approach to whatever it is that you're building, right? Okay, so that's it. We have some time for some questions. No questions. I was done really good. Oh, there's one. Uh, I've seen, I guess, one common pain point with this level of like early and often transparency is people, I guess, providing feedback, I guess, before the um, creator the author is ready for feedback necessarily uh. before they feel ready for feedback. And there's almost like a sense of obligation to address those comments, either by resolving them or responding to them to justifying your um, method or what you have done. I found like the best way that I've been able to encourage more transparency is to help people understand that they aren't necessarily obligated to implement every suggestion that is made yeah. or even respond to every suggestion that is made. Yeah. But just to accept them as feedback and understand, you know, think about it. Absolutely. I, I, one of the things that we've done in the past is um, you, you can comment on an issue as long as it's something about that, that's actually actionable. Um, but until it's associated with an, uh, if you commit with issue, does everybody commit with an issue number or tag in their commitment? No. Okay. <laughs> well, ideally, like for most, uh, you're, you're doing that so you can track where the, how that issue was fixed, right? Especially for a bug, you know, you, you wouldn't be working for me for very long if you weren't doing that. Um, but I think the idea is if you hold it, hold the comments until there's an issue associated with it, right? Because initially, if you're building something, yeah, you, you know, if you've, all you've written is a, a, a deployment script or a bash script or something like that, yeah, you don't need a lot of comments on it, but sometimes it could be positive feedback. You, you're still accepting it, but you're not acting on it. Once there's an issue, then you have to start to be responsive, right? And I think that helps a little bit. Um, and issues, to be clear, are not always bugs, right? A lot of times they're subtasks that are associated with an Epic, most of the time, hopefully, as you're building out new features. Um, if they're tagged properly, they are, you'll see that initially. They're not always tagged properly, just like there's not always comments in code, um, and just like there's not always issues associated with the, uh, with the commit. But ideally, that's what you want to be, you want, that's how you want to manage it, especially if you're being transparent, and you can manage a little bit more of that overlog of communication. Yeah, anything else, yeah. You spoke about uh, a good way to increase, you know, as you're increasing transparency, making safe spaces for less experienced team members to feel comfortable speaking up, asking questions, making mistakes. Yeah. Um, you know, and I guess the same for the more experienced members <laughs> too. As you increase transparency, just kind of widening that circle of people who can see us making mistakes or 
good point here. Comment early as as team members are, are forming ideas. Yeah. How do you ensure as you're increasing that space that it stays a safe space? Yeah, I think you know this is a really mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, if you you can also look at ethical AI implementations as well and how they test ethical AI um, to see as feedback goes into that into a process or a loop like that. Is it is it retraining that AI to do something you don't necessarily want it to do anymore, right? And when are you testing that process and continuing to test that process? I think that's the thing that ideally, uh, and it's easier, frankly, in a remote environment because you can you can actually look in Slack and see who's commenting on what. You can look in issues and see who's commenting and what they're saying. Um, but you honestly, you need a lead that has bought into the transparency process as well as the other side of this, which is why we call it kind of therapy and not just transparency, is they have to understand those issues that people are dealing with and making sure that it is a positive environment to work in, right? If you have a code of conduct, does everybody have a code of conduct in their open source repo? No, one, one person, really. Okay, it, I, please ask for that in your, in, your, in your repos, right? Ask for a code of conduct. Ask for a, a guidelines for how to communicate because, I mean, even I think even uh, if you look at some of the main GitHub uh, repositories out there, that there's people can you can fork code of conducts from other organizations and use those, but that helps so much with that. If you have those bylaws sort of already laid out in front of you, you're not going to have to worry about it down the road. You're just going to have to respond to it because it will go wrong at some point, or somebody won't read it. But you have something to reference them to. And, and instead of having to shame them in front of the group or something, you can just message, hey, here's the code of conduct. Please don't do that anymore. Um, and I think that's, that's certainly one way to do it. But if it's overwhelming, then I think you've got, you have to have somebody in a leadership position that can come back and, and make that address, and adjust it for the rest of the team as well. Yeah, good. Anything else? Oh, one more. Um, you talked about a little bit at the beginning about how uh, you were building out dashboards and kind of some of that stuff. Can you talk a little bit about how you would use um, the dashboards and recording in like a continual um, process during this transparency? Yeah, if you if you do uh, a typical release management process, uh, one of the things that you can do is um, build, what we've done is, is build, just build surveys for each release. You put out release notes, right, hopefully everybody, puts out release notes for every new release that goes out for their project. Ah, just append a survey at the end of that, right? And that, that will help you to get that feedback. And then you create, I, you couldn't see the dashboard, but one of the, one of the questions, our, our project was named uh, TOLA data, right? TOLA, and we, one of the questions was every time we'd ask, do you know what TOLA means? Um, and <laughs> every time it got, it got to the point where we had, I think, 40 different variations of what TOLA meant. And we didn't realize in, in different languages, it means different things as well. <laughs> so we got, uh, but I think it, we learned a lot from those dashboards and people enjoyed seeing that process go up there for each release and seeing the feedback and then being part of the process and feeling like they could vote on an issue and be part of that. Yes, this needs to be prioritized or no, it doesn't. And that's how you get, I mean, does everybody have GitHub sponsors? Anybody? use GitHub sponsorships? No, okay. Well, that's a great way to get feedback as well as earn some money for your project potentially because what sponsors do more than anything else is say, I really love this project, but I need feature X. Can you build that for me? And you say, yeah, give me, you know, here's the price, go ahead and, and ask for that and we'll find a developer to work on it. I wish we could do that internally. Yeah. <laughs> Well, internal development platforms are sort of built that way. You can gamify internal development platforms to where you have a dashboard, right? And you have a report on who's been committing, well, commit, uh, commit, number of commits and lines of code is not a good metric, right? And we all know that. But there are ways to add that sort of like, how many, how many comments are you making? How many pull requests have you reviewed? Like those types of things you can gamify and put it like a, a $20 Amazon gift card on there, right? And most companies will sponsor something like that. All right, anything else? One more question. One more, okay. From a project management perspective, I've seen a couple different cultures, particularly amongst like different types of implementing Agile, where 
tasks are broken down into different levels of granularity. Yeah. And I found that to like maximize the impact of transparency, we're trying to get like the most granular level of, of tasks. But in recent companies I've worked, I've seen engineers who prefer to take on an epic and then just work that epic for three months. And <laughs> I don't yeah. get any, like as a TPM, I don't get any like insight into where that's at. Yeah. Uh, I should have asked how many product managers there were in the room so we could all point at you for every question. Um, no, I, I, I mean, I feel your pain with that because I, I know a lot of developers that will take on an epic and not tell me that they've taken on an epic and they're doing that in a branch that they haven't committed. And so I can't see anything. And then they, they finally commit it without actually paying attention to what everybody else has been working on and it generates hundreds of conflicts. And usually I'm the one that has to go back then and resolve each one of those conflicts. I think, yeah, I mean, that's where tra <laughs> transparency obviously fixes that problem. If, they're, if they are aware of what, what everybody else has been working on and following, they're not going to do that. But if, in your case, if, they're, if they want, if, if you're, what you're talking about is they want to work on the big problems, right? To me... Has everybody you know the rock star versus superstar approach to software developers? Have you ever heard that? It's an old Apple term. Uh, rock star doesn't mean what you think it means. It's like rock steady, somebody that's constantly contributing, is always dependable, but they're, you know, they don't have a big ego. They're not somebody that's looking to go to the next level. And a superstar is that person, right? And that's the person that wants to take on the epics, wants to take on the big problems, but doesn't want to work on the small problems. And you need to have a balance, I think, of that, but you have to know how to manage the superstars. And if I, if I knew how to do that, I probably wouldn't be here. I'd probably be working somewhere else. Um, but I, I do think there's a couple of ways that you can help mitigate that. One is you, maybe you want to move them to more of an architect role, right? And a lot of people think the software architect isn't a real role. Okay, they don't, they don't like that role. But I... I I think that in certain cases, that's what that is. That's somebody that wants to work on a big problem, start a, almost a sub-project, right, within the project. I think that's something that you can do there. The other thing you can do is have them mentoring more directly, right? Work with them as a, as a pair programmer with a junior programmer, because a lot of times, especially if it's an ego problem, that will feed that ego problem a little bit, and you'll be able to then help manage both of those problems. And especially a junior developer that's not getting listened to, if they get to go and work with the lead for a few weeks, that all of a sudden their confidence is going to come up, right? So that's certainly a way to manage that problem. Outside of that, I don't have a lot of <laughs> solutions for you in that. But I think there, there's, if you find something that works, I think it's usually an individual problem that, you, that individual can deal with. I don't know if there's a global way to manage that. All right. Anything else? Cool. All right, thanks everybody.